Welcome to the video accompanying chapter 2 on coordinate systems. In this chapter we're going to talk about three coordinate systems. There will be rectangular or Cartesian coordinate systems, cylindrical coordinate systems, and spherical coordinate systems. It turns out that in, in many of the problems you've solved until this point, it has been sufficient to just have the rectangular coordinate systems. But the geometries in this course will become more important, more complex, and as a result, the problems will be significantly simplified by using the correct coordinate system. We're also going to talk about how to transform vectors and, and how to express points in, in various uh, coordinate systems, and then also we'll talk about some, some mathematical fundamentals like differential length, differential surface area, and differential volume. Those things are not going to seem very important today, but this, this is the second of two, uh, only two uh, lessons that are really just laying a mathematical foundation, uh, and we will absolutely be coming back to the, to the equations you're going to see in this, in this chapter many times throughout the rest of the, of the book. So obviously you've already seen, you've already found the, the place to get to the video. Uh, we're going to work some examples in chapter two, and I'm also going to hit the highlights of the most important concepts that you should understand. Um, I was about 40 years old before I realized that Cartesian coordinate systems were named in honor of Rene Descartes. I, I always kind of thought it was sort of related to cartography or something like that. But no, it took the second half of his last name and then it becomes Cartesian or rectangular coordinate systems. When I was a student, it was very common to refer to them as Cartesian. Now I think rectangular is, is, tends to be the, the, the preferred uh, name. For those coordinates. So we're, as we're going to see, the coordinate system we're going to adopt to solve each problem in this book is going to come from the geometry of the problem that underlies it. So for example, if, if the problem involves a sphere, we're going to use spherical coordinate systems. If the problem involves a cylinder, we're going to use cylindrical coordinate systems and so forth. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be able to choose the coordinate system simply based on the symmetry of the problem itself. Let's talk about the simplest of these, the rectangular coordinate system. Uh, you can see here that, uh, that and ignore that thumb for the moment, I, I added that, it's not in your notes. Um, but this has the x, the y, and the z coordinates. And, and essentially all that we're saying is move out a certain distance in x, move out a certain distance in y, and move, out a, move up a certain distance in z. And so as we talked about last time, any vector in three-dimensional space can be a linear superposition of those three unit vectors. Now another thing that we that we need to think about for the first time is that we need to we need, need to use what are called right-handed coordinate systems. And right-handed coordinate systems are those in which these rules are true. Now, I've I've listed this as equation 2.1. I do understand there are three equations here, but each one of them are really redundant on the other two, so that's why I've only given them one equation. Um, and, and these any one of these three relationships would verify that you're using right-handed coordinate systems. And so if you wanted to use the right-hand rule to see what is a sub x crossed with a sub y, that's where this thumb is going to come in. You put your fingers, all four of your fingers, not your thumb, but your four fingers, in the direction of the first vector, that's x, and then you curl them in the direction of the second vector, that's y, and then your hand should look a lot like this picture right here because your thumb is going to be pointed up in the z direction. Now we saw last time that you can also do that by pointing your index finger in the direction of the first vector, your middle finger in the direction of the second vector, and your thumb in the direction of the and, and the thumb will be in the direction of the cross product. It's just two different ways of doing the, the cross product and, and they yield the same exact results. So as you can see, uh, this coordinate system does in fact obey the a sub x cross a sub y equals a sub z, and therefore it's also guaranteed to obey these other two as well. I'll leave that for you to, to verify, uh, but it also means that this is a right-handed coordinate system. In this book and in this class, every coordinate system we will use is going to be a right-handed coordinate system, which means that we can apply the right-hand rule to do our, to do our cross products. Now here's a little a picture of what we call a differential element. This, this concept of differential quantities is going to be very important in this class. We're going to be doing a lot of derivations with differential quantities. And what I want you to picture is that although this cube in figure 2.2 is, is shown as having size, I want you to think of it as being differentially small or infinitesimally small. And as a result, um, <clears throat> we can take, uh, we, we can think of this as being something that could be integrated over, for example, or differentiated over. So it's going to be in, it's going to be differentially small. It's going to be infinitesimally small. But we need to think about what are the lengths of the sides. Well, we're going to go ahead and, and refer to the, the lengths as d 
dx and dy and dz, and I'm going to erase that just so that it doesn't mess up the figure. Uh, but we also need to think about what is the differential volume. Well, this is easy because it's a cube, so it's just d sub x time, or dx times dy times dz. That'll be the volume of the cube. And then there are also six surface areas that we need to think about. And uh, for example, there's the front, the front surface area, which we've indicated as d sub s x, ds sub x. Uh, that's going to be uh, uh, pointing in the positive x direction. And the area of this front face is going to be dy times dz. The right hand face, well, that's, that's going to be uh, pointing in the positive y direction. But it's going to have, if you look at the two lengths, the length would be here and the length would be here. So it's going to be dx times dz. And then the, the area of the top, of course, well, that's going to be uh, pointing in the positive z direction. And it's going to have the two lengths are going to be these two sides. And the, this is going to be dx times dy. So we can identify uh, the differential volume, equation 2.2. We can also identify the differential areas. Now you'll notice that I put a plus or minus in front of each of these. That's because only three of the sides are visible to us when we're looking at the, at the, at the differential cube uh, in this orientation. There's also a left side, a back side, and a bottom side, which we can't see. And those would have vectors that would point away from the surface in the negative x, negative y, and negative z directions. It's important to know that, that when we talk about surface areas, especially if, if it is the surface area of a closed volume, we are always talking about the, surf, the, the vector is always pointing outward from the volume. So you can see that all three of these vectors here are pointing outward from the cube. Um, because it's a closed surface, we always choose the outward facing vectors. So we have the three, uh, we have the differential volume, and we have the three visible and then three sort of inverted uh, surface areas for a total of six surface areas. We'll often have to account for all six of those surface areas, and, and having them in vector form will be very convenient. The last thing that we need to do is we need to think about what is the differential length of this, of this, uh, of this little cube. And that differential length is going from uh, one corner to the opposite corner. And most typically, we're going to go from the corner that is adjacent. And I'll, I'll sort of try to draw a circle right here to indicate this is the corner that's adjacent to the vertex, to the, to the origin. And this is the corner that's the furthest from the origin. And so we're going we're gonna to think about how can we go from one of those corners to the other corner. The way that we do that is simply by going d sub x in the x direction, d sub y in the y direction, and d sub z in the z direction. So equation 2.6 is going to give us the differential length of that cube. So none of this is going to mean a lot to you today. Uh, you're not saying, oh, thank goodness, I've, I've always wanted to know what the differential surface areas were. But we're going to come back and do derivations where these quantities, and in particular, I'll say these four quantities right here are going to be extremely important to us. Now let's talk a little bit about the cylindrical coordinate system. Well, you'll remember that in the rectangular coordinate system, it was kind of like going left, right, and then forward, backward, and then up, down. But in the cylindrical coordinate system, we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to, first of all, uh, you know what? I'm going to try a different color to see if I can help to um, illustrate the picture a little bit better. So we're going to, first of all, take this angle theta, or I'm sorry, this angle phi, and we're going to sort of aim in the direction of where we want to go. So rather than going forward, backward, and left, right, instead we're going to aim, and then we're going to march a, a certain predetermined distance called a sub rho. When we get to there, we have identified a single point in the plane, in the xy plane, and then we just get in an elevator or some sort of a lift car, and we go up to the point that we're looking at. So we adjust the angle, and then we move outward, and then we move upward. And if we do those three steps, then we can, again, specify any point in the three-dimensional plane. Uh, and, and so what we find, then, is that there are actually only two movements. Because, because this, this uh, step right here, we're not actually moving. We're actually just aiming. We're rotating in place. And so there really isn't a unit vector that rotates in that direction. So we're going to say that we, we have only two motions. There's the motion outward in the correct direction, and then there's the motion upward. And those two motions are going to be in the a sub rho and a sub z directions, respectively. But then we also have to say with phi. So with phi equals, in this case, it looks like maybe about 70 degrees. With phi equals 30 degrees. With phi equals 120 degrees. We always have to specify phi, but we don't list it with, say, a unit vector. 
as we might as we might have in in the in the uh, uh, rectangular coordinates. So this takes a little bit of getting used to, but it is the it is the best way to uh, to reference a three dimensional vector in uh, cylindrical coordinates. Here you can see these are the uh, these are the uh, equations that would specify a right-handed coordinate system uh, for for a system that is in uh, uh, cylindrical coordinates. So again, we need to think about the differential quantity. And in this case, it, it's a little bit more complicated because we do have this, this sort of d phi right here. And that d phi needs to be multiplied by a distance rho. If you think about if phi were in radians, and if you multiplied that phi in radians by the radius, then you would end up with the arc length. And that arc length is, in fact, this inner edge right here. That inner edge is rho d phi. Now, we don't need to think about anything special with dz. In fact, the z quantity in, in cylindrical coordinates is identical to the z quantity in rectangular coordinates. And then we have d rho, which goes along the other edge. Now, you might say, hey, what's this edge over here? Because clearly, it's different than rho d phi. But no, it's not. This is actually also rho d phi right here. And the reason why it is is because remember that this, this blue unit, this blue element here, is infinitesimally small. And since it's infinitesimally small, then rho d phi is going to be the length of both of those two sides. They're, they're infinitely close to each other, so rho really hasn't had a chance to change in between them. And as a result, the lengths are going to be the same. So we know that the lengths of the sides, and again, we can specify the differential volume, the differential surface areas, and then also the differential uh, length. And so we can see here, here's the differential volume. Uh, remember that this quantity right here, that's the inner edge. And then this quantity right here, you could think of that as being sort of the, the uh, bottom left edge. And then the dz, that's sort of the edge that goes up. So we have, we have this distance right here, and we have this distance right here, and we have this distance right here. We're multiplying those three quantities together to get the differential volume. And so we could say rho d phi d rho dz, but it really runs off the tongue a lot better to say rho d rho d phi dz. So if you find yourself trying to remember what is this uh, expression, it just, just like c dv dt sounds so good, rho d rho d phi dz sounds just as good. And so that's an easy way to remember it. It just means that we're going we're gonna to move this d rho and put it here in between the rho and the d phi. And then the differential um, surface areas, again, there's a plus and minus for each of them. So we have rho d phi dz a sub rho. We have d rho dz a sub phi and rho d rho d phi in the a sub z. And uh, you can derive each of those just simply by looking at that figure. And then finally, there is a differential length. And in the differential length, we have to move in all three dimensions the corresponding quantity. And so we have to move d rho in the a sub rho direction. We have to move rho d phi in an a sub phi direction, which, which really we're not. The rho is the motion. Uh, the d phi is actually not the motion. And then dz is in the a sub z direction. Now let's talk about how we can convert vectors between rectangular and cylindrical coordinate systems. And then we're going to have a, a couple of examples to work out. Um, remember that we can express the, the quantities either in rectangular or in cylindrical coordinates. And, uh, and if we wanted to convert a vector from one coordinate system to the other, we can just simply use a, a set of equations that can be derived from the geometry of the problem. And so if we wanted to convert from, uh, from rectangular to cylindrical coordinates, we could use these three equations. Given a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z, we can calculate a sub rho, phi, and a sub z. And then similarly, if we were given a sub rho, phi and a sub z, we can use these three equations to calculate a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z. Okay, so let's, let's see some examples here. Um, uh, we're going to first of all do a conversion from rectangular into cylindrical coordinates. And I'm going to uh, go back to the black pen because I think that'll look better for this example. Uh, in this case, we know the three quantities. We know a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z. So let's calculate a sub rho. So a, oh, that's too thick. Let's calculate a sub rho. a sub rho is going to be the square root, and these are all simply the equations from the previous page, a sub x squared plus a sub y squared which in this case is the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared 
which is the square root of 13, which is 3.60. And then a sub, I'm sorry, not a sub, but phi, is going to be the arctan, the inverse tangent of a sub y divided by a sub x, which is the inverse tangent of 2 divided by 3, which it turns out is 33.7 degrees. And then a sub z is just the same a sub z that we had before, which is which was and is 1. And so therefore, if I wanted to express this vector in cylindrical coordinates, it would be 3.60 in the a sub rho direction. Let me try that one again in the a sub rho direction, plus um, 1 in the a sub z direction with phi equals 33.7 degrees. And that would be the same vector quantity that was in the original problem statement. What if we wanted to go the other way? If we know the, the cylindrical coordinates and we wanted to convert to uh, rectangular coordinates, well, that should say rectangular coordinates. I'll fix that for your version. Uh, so we know that we want b sub x. b sub x is going to be b rho times the cosine of phi, which is going to be 3 times the cosine of 35 degrees, which is, uh, is 2.46. And then b sub y is b sub rho times the sine of phi, which is 3 sine 35 degrees, which is 1.72. And we know that b sub z is equal to 1. And so therefore, we can write the vector in rectangular form as 2.46 a sub x plus 1.72 a sub y plus 1 a sub z. And we've completed our conversion. Now we can also convert not only vectors, but we can also convert entire functions. Because it turns out that in this class we're often going to have functions that, that are themselves written in terms of, of uh, various uh, coordinate systems. You know, we're used to writing functions in terms of x, y, and z, but we could also have a function in terms of rho, phi, and z. And so let's imagine that we had a function that was in terms of x, y, and z. Well, every time that you see an x, you just replace it with rho cosine theta, or cosine phi. Every time you see a y, you replace it with rho sine of phi, and z can stay unchanged. And then similarly, if you had one that was in cylindrical coordinates, rho would be replaced by x squared plus y squared. Phi would be replaced by the arctangent of y over x. So actually, um, these, these questions are sometimes ones that students miss on the exams, but it is just about the easiest questions that, that can be asked on the exam because it's just a, just a pattern replacement. So here I'm going to say f of rho comma phi comma z. And notice that we're not talking about uh, unit vectors here or anything else like that. It's, it's just a function. We have x squared plus 3y cubed plus z. So let's go ahead and, and uh, replace the x. So x is, oh, I think I accidentally erased that f. So x is rho cosine of phi, and we have x squared, so I put a squared there, plus 3 times y cubed. But y is rho sine of phi, and that quantity is then cubed, and then z remains unchanged. So therefore, this is equal to rho squared uh, cosine squared phi, let me fix that rho, uh, plus 3 rho cubed sine cubed phi times z. And if you were uh, like a trigonometry guru, you might be able to find some trig substitutions or something that would, so that it would simplify that, but for me that is sufficient. We have converted that function into uh, the cylindrical coordinate system. Now let's convert this function into the rectangular coordinate system. We will be able to do a little bit of simplification here. So f of x comma y comma z is going to be rho squared. Well, rho is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and that quantity is squared. 
plus z remains unchanged, plus rho, we get another square root of x squared plus y squared. I'm going to erase that underline there. And then we have cosine of phi, okay? But phi is, is, uh, phi is the arctangent, so this is the cosine of an angle, and that angle is the angle whose tangent is y over x. Now, if we weren't dedicated students, we could just leave it like that, but let's go one step further. I want to draw the triangle here, and this is going to be phi, and if the arctangent is y over x, then that means that the opposite is y and the adjacent is x. And we can then fill in the hypotenuse as x squared plus y squared. And then what is the cosine of phi? So the cosine of phi is the adjacent x divided by the hypotenuse square root of x squared plus y squared. So we can substitute that back in. Let me go ahead and square this first quantity. I get x squared plus y squared plus z times the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then the cosine of phi is x divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared. The x squared plus y squareds are going to cancel. And I'm left with x squared plus y squared plus x times z. And I actually could have saved myself some trouble if I would have recognized that this rho cosine of phi is actually just equal to x. Now, the, the, it all worked out, but I could have saved myself some trouble if I would have recognized that. But the method will give the correct result every time. It just may not, it, if, if we hadn't gone to this extra trouble, it might not have been as simplified as it could have been. Let's quickly now talk about the spherical coordinate system. We've seen two, and this third one is, is similar. Uh, interestingly now, we're going to, and again, I'm going to switch to red so that it doesn't blend into the black. We're going to aim in a horizontal direction, and then we're going to aim in a vertical direction. And then we're going to shoot out a fixed distance. And so really, we're only doing one actual motion, and that one actual motion is in the A, is in the, uh, a sub R direction. Uh, but we're, we're aiming in the horizontal direction, we're aiming in the xy plane, and then we're aiming relative to z at the vertical axis. So we're, we're starting at, at theta equals zero would be pointing straight up vertical, but we're then taking our arm and we're pointing down until we get to the place where we want to go, and then we're going to shoot out along that, along that vector to the correct distance. So there's only one motion, so we're going to call this a sub r times the unit vector a sub r, and then we have to specify with phi and theta. And so that's going to give us, uh, it's going to give us two, uh, two directions and then a motion. And so that will allow us to find any, any uh, three-dimensional point in space using just those three quantities. Here again are the three, the three equations listed as one equation that can be used to verify that it's a right-handed system. Here is the differential volume. Now, I should, I should say, if we look up here, I haven't shown the differential volume because it gets to be pretty complicated. So we're not going to derive these, these expressions. I'll just tell you that uh, here, in this case, we now have to multiply both in the a sub theta and in the a sub phi. We have to multiply both of those by r. Uh, and so that's where we end up with the r squared. We have a sine of theta, dr, d theta, d phi. And then we have the three differential, I'm sorry, six differential surface areas. And then we have a differential length. So again, if this were a class on vector, uh, vector calculus or, or vector arithmetic, we might uh, do derivations of these quantities. But I don't think that it's worth your time to do so. Now, if we wanted to convert vectors between rectangular and spherical systems, uh, we, we can do the same thing that we did before. Remember that we had three equations that we could use to uh, calculate the, the quantities in the, in the cylindrical system. Now we have three equations to calculate the quantities in the, in the spherical system. We also have three quantities that can calculate the values in the rectangular system. So let's see these, these examples. Oh, I should just quickly mention also, um, there are equations that can convert directly from cylindrical to spherical and vice versa, but it's extremely unusual that you'd be asked to do that. And so I'm not going to give you those equations. It's just one more set of equations for you to have to shuffle through. If you find that you have to go from cylindrical to spherical or vice versa, just go to rectangular first. You have, a, you have 
you know, you have spherical is here, cylindrical is here, and rectangular is here. You know how to do these conversions, and you know how to do these conversions. And I'm not showing you how to do these conversions, but if you wanted to go from spherical to, to cylindrical or vice versa, just go through rectangular, and, uh, and having done so, then you'll be prepared to, uh, to, to get to the correct place where you want to go. So how would we convert this number into spherical coordinates? Well, we know that, uh, well, let's switch back to the black pen, and let's switch back to the shot narrow line width. So we have a sub r is equal to the square root of a sub x squared plus a sub y squared plus a sub z squared. And this is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. And this is 3.74. And then we have theta. And by the way, in spherical coordinates, it's very important to keep theta and phi uh, separated because they mean two very different things. And we need to make sure that we're getting the thing that we're looking for. So this is the inverse tangent of the square root of ax squared plus ay squared, all of that divided by a sub z. So this is the inverse tangent of the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared divided by 1, which is 74.5 degrees. And that's a 4. And then phi is the arc tangent, inverse tangent, of a sub y divided by a sub x, which in this case is the inverse tangent of 2 thirds which is 33.7 degrees. And then I can write the overall function, the overall vector a is 3.74 in the a sub r direction with theta is equal to 74.5 degrees and phi is equal to 33.7 degrees. And then if we want to do a similar uh, calculation uh, from, from spherical into rectangular coordinates, we just simply calculate each of the individual uh, components. B sub x is B sub r, sine of theta, cosine of phi, which is 5, sine of 35 degrees, cosine of 60 degrees for this problem, which is 1.43. B sub y is B sub r sine of, whoops, got to be careful, sine of theta and then sine of phi, which is 5 sine 35 degrees sine 60 degrees, which is 2.48. And then B sub z is B sub r cosine of theta which is 5 cosine of 35 degrees, which is 4.09. And then the overall vector is 1.43 a sub x plus 2.48 a sub y plus 4.09 a sub z. And that's how you can do conversions between spherical and rectangular coordinates. The last thing for today is converting functions between spherical and rectangular coordinates. And just as we saw with the cylindrical ones, we can, we can have uh, these six equations here can be used to convert. So let's convert f of x comma y comma z into spherical coordinates. So I'm gonna say f of r comma theta comma phi is equal to, and now I start with x squared, but x is this quantity right here. So I'm going to take r sine of theta cosine of phi, the quantity squared, plus 3 times y cubed. But y is this quantity right here. So this is r sine of theta sine of phi, the quantity cubed. And then I also still have a z on here. So that's r cosine of theta. And that can be reduced 
a little bit, not much, r squared sine squared theta cosine squared phi plus 3r cubed. Um, let's see, there's a, oh, it's actually, there's an r cubed, and then there's another r there, so that's actually r to the fourth power, times the sine cubed of theta times the sine cubed of phi times the cosine of theta. So that's a big, nasty equation, but it is exactly equivalent to the one that we started with. And then if we wanted to convert um, r squared plus r cosine of theta, um, in, in that case, let me just take a moment and be a little bit extra smart here and observe, oh, r cosine theta, oh, r cosine theta. So this is actually just z. Now we can we can go some extra effort here. If, if I wanted to say, okay, I'm gonna take the cosine of theta and this is theta right here. Well, the arc tangent of that is gonna be over here and this is gonna be the square root of x squared plus y squared and this is gonna be z. And if we do that, then this is gonna be the square root of, oh gosh, it's the square root of the square root of x squared plus y squared, that quantity squared plus z quantity squared. Well, this is now x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which if we look back up here is actually just the quantity for r. So this is actually just r. And so therefore the cosine of theta is just gonna be z divided by r, and therefore r cosine of theta is just equal to z. So we can either do the shortcut where we recognize it immediately, or we can do the long cut where we actually do all of the necessary work to do the conversion. But in either case, we end up with the same answer. F of r comma theta comma phi is equal to r squared. So this is gonna be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That square root squared plus, and then r cosine theta is just z. So we end up with x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus z. And that's our equation. So we've seen quite a lot in this lesson. This is one of the longer lessons, uh, one of the longer chapters of the book. Uh, we talked about points in three-dimensional space, how they can be represented by three different orthogonal unit vectors. We talked about rectangular, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. And then in each of those coordinate systems, we can then have a differential element. We talked about differential volume, differential surface area, differential length. Uh, those were not, didn't seem very important today, but they will be important before this, this uh, is over. Um, and we're always gonna use a right-handed coordinate system, and we're gonna convert either a vector or a function between rectangular and cylindrical coordinates and between rectangular and spherical coordinates. And if you wanted to convert from cylindrical to spherical coordinates, just go to, go to rectangular on the way.